To be perfectly honest, there are very few motoring stories in the Caribbean. However, this is no ordinary Caribbean island. This is Cuba, home to some of the best motoring stories in the world, and it must be said, some of the worst. Hold on a minute. Something is not right here. Well, I mean, a lot isn't right here, but specifically. is very definitely wrong. This may look like an old MGA, but beneath the bonnet beats the heart of a very different animal. Oh dear, oh dear. That is a larder engine. It's funny, isn't it? Cars can survive the Arizona desert, they can survive an Arctic winter, but give them the slightest whiff of communism, and they go all to pieces. Communism came to Cuba in the 1950s, when Havana was where high-rolling American mobsters lined the pockets of a president called Batista. Peace Prize winner, he was not. Batista's police managed to assassinate no less than 20,000 young people during the period of his tyranny. The repression, every hour, every day, every instant that was lived in Havana, the whole country was really ferocious and bestial. This made the people led by Fidel Castro rise up in rebellion to fight Batista. In the clandestine struggle, they fought equally in the mountains as in the cities. It was a period when the Cuban family lived in great sadness, in great agony, but with a great spirit of rebellion. A spirit of rebellion which enabled the success of the revolution on the 1st of January, 1959. There is not communism or Marxism in our idea. Our political philosophy is representative democracy and social justice in a well-planned economy. <laughs> so well-planned that this is what Havana looks like today. Russian missiles may not have made it here, but their architects did. There's now a strange Soviet-style concrete foreground to the peeling colonial backdrop of yesteryear. Russian cars made it here too. Moscovitches and Larders were given to government officials and important workers. But everyone else had to make do with what they had before the revolution. Tuve un Alfa Romeo como el que regaló, le regaló el Agacán a la Rita Jaibo, una artista norteamericana, igualito, y se trajo aquí un carro con carrocería farina. Y ese automóvil le compré yo. Le metí en una finca ahí en Cantarrana, previendo ya que iba a venir la intervención de todo. 
y resulta que donde yo le metí intervinieron la finca con el carro, voló, no le vi más. Un hispano suiza, creo que el hispano anda por ahí, un hispano suiza que yo tenía. El hispano suiza. También me le llevaron, me le llevaron todo y todo desapareció. Entonces aquí había mil automóviles, mil automóviles también al gobierno le dio por partirles, por destrozarles. Explícale, automóviles buenísimos, americanos y no americanos, que les cortaron con soplete por la mitad, a tirar es para chatarra. Of course, a great many survived, but think about this. When the Americans closed the door on Cuba and banned trade, there were no more spare parts for all the cars. And 33 years on, there still aren't. There are no quick fits in Havana. So how come they're all still going? I'd like you to meet Hector, Cuba's answer to Keith Floyd, the silver-toothed galloping gourmet of Havana. Now, he's going to explain how you make brake fluid. This is the real stuff. Trouble is, in Cuba, it is very hard to come by and furiously expensive. There is an alternative, though. And what you need is brown sugar. White will do if you have a larder, but for those old Chevys, brown is best. You also need, and this is a curious one, some shampoo and some neat alcohol. <laughs> oh, my God! Oh, God, take it away, <laughs> God. So what you do then is you, making sure there are no flies have crept into your bottle, add the alcohol there. It depends how many cars you're looking to serve, obviously, about how much you need, but that should be enough for... Well, it should be enough for a Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Right, a few teaspoonfuls of the brown sugar. In it goes. Cleanliness not an important issue then on this sort of cooking, obviously. And then you simply stir it up like that. Yeah? It's going to be delicious, isn't it? Now look, you do this for about three minutes, okay? But to uh, save time and in the best traditions of cookery programs, here is one we did earlier. No sticky back plastic this time, though, eh, mate? So there you go. Now that is enough to feed, well, at least one Chevrolet. Uh, and now we're going to need some shampoo in there, aren't we, for the consistency. As with any good sauce, consistency does matter. And uh, brake fluid is no exception. Hector is actually a chef on a Cuban merchant ship, so he knows what he's doing here. Now, this is going to give it that all-important brake fluid texture. Mmm. And then we just mix it up a bit more. And that's about it, I think. Look at that. Look at that, ladies and gentlemen. Brake fluid for less than a dollar. Thanks, Hector. Mrs. Hector, meanwhile, was to be found in the sitting room making a hood for their Cadillac. And you'll find the same sort of thing going on all over the island. Sit back now and watch these guys make a new rear wing for a car that in England we'd throw away. All they're going to use is some brown paper, a pair of scissors, a hammer and the roof from a knackered Cadillac. It may say Yamaha on the steering wheel, but this 1955 Thunderbird has a larder engine. Most cars have a Russian engine these days. 
but not this one. For 20 years, it's been in a shed, untouched and unloved, until we rolled into town. The whole thing was seized. It had no brakes, no hoses, no battery, no starter motor, no exhaust. It was a shell. But we desperately wanted to get it going again. It would take nine people, nine days. Disappointment followed disappointment. And then, just 24 hours before we were due to go home, it coughed into life. It was quite a moment. The reason why I've been so keen to get this car going and actually take a drive is that it once belonged to someone pretty special in Cuba's history. Che Guevara. Whoa! She moves! And so, there you have it. The first person for 20 years to drive the Chevy that Che used when he was president of the National Bank. I feel no sense of elation, though, because I discovered this morning that Che is, in fact, a nickname. In his native Argentina, it means pal or mate. This man, whose face stared down at me from a poster on my study wall at school, who symbolised all that was good about rebellion in the 50s and 60s with his long hair and his smoking habit, his real name was Ernest and he drove the slowest Chevrolet in the West. And sometimes, it was even slower than that. Well, I don't know how much we've paid these Cuban mechanics, but they don't deserve every penny. hot in here and I don't think it's entirely down to the fact there's no air conditioning it's too damn hot in here I suspect they'd made the fuel pump out of an old garden sprinkler, but it didn't seem to matter. We had set fire to a Cuban icon. <laughs> Understandably, we never even asked if we could have a go in some of the other vehicles from the revolution. Castro's Land Rover. The bulldozer, they turned into a tank. And the bread van that a bunch of students had used to storm Batista's palace. Another bunch of students had even bigger ideas, ideas that would rock the world of motor racing. They called themselves commandos, and on the eve of the Cuban Grand Prix, they kidnapped Juan Manuel Fangio from this hotel lobby. Now, this man went on in life to be Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, but at the time, he was one of the kidnappers. The operation carried out in this lobby was what we called Operation Fangio, that is to say, kidnapping to detain him with us in such a way as to prevent him competing in the Grand Prix the next day. He was surrounded by many friends, his minder, 
some mechanics, many people. But in spite of this, two of our colleagues from the commando force entered the hotel and with the threat of a pistol captured Fangio. They neutralized the guards and took him to the waiting car. I think he understood the principal points of our history and the way of life at that moment in Cuba. The proof of this is that we developed a friendship that continued until the last days of his life. We brought Fangio to this very house and told him that once the revolution had succeeded, he would be our guest of honor. This is spooky. I am in the house where they held Fangio. More than that, I'm in the same room. Yes, this was the room where Fangio was kept. The house was occupied by a family, a widowed lady with her two daughters. All three were militant participants of the revolution. They were Fangio's hostesses, so to speak, during the time that he was held here. Even though Fangio was otherwise engaged, the race went ahead. A mistake because some say revolutionaries had sprayed oil on the track. One car ploughed into the crowd and that was the end of motor racing in Cuba. Despite his ordeal, Fangio sympathised with his abductors, telling the world's media afterwards that he supported their cause and that he never once feared for his life. He wrote to them right up to his death in 1995. But never again would Havana streets echo to the sound of finely tuned racing cars. In 1994, some estimates said 2,000 people a day were trying to make the 90-mile sea voyage to Key West. They were using inner tubes, oil drums, egg boxes, anything so long as they could get to freedom. Freedom from communism and its buses. They cram 300 people onto these things. That's as many as you get on a 747. Even a veal calf would complain. Which is why some people choose to use them without getting on board. The trouble with being pulled along by a bus is that it keeps stopping all the time. This is the answer. Part bicycle, part fumigation pump. It's the Rally Wayfarer ZZR 11. <laughs> Things were going well until the fumigation pump spark plug sent 2,000 volts through my leg. Oh, this is not fair. He's using the motor out of a chainsaw. Oh, look at that one! You can't have a bike like that. Tree cutter. I know it is. That is a chainsaw motor. Haven't he got a fumigation pump? I was being thrashed until I fixed my spark plug. This is pathetic. But then it all went horribly wrong again when I got to a one in sixty-eight gradient. In Cuba, all the animals are equal. But, how did Orwell put it, some of them are more equal than others. There are rich people here, you know, and they need something which 
befits their status. Thank you. Say it ain't so, Joe, please. Say it ain't so. That's not what I want. Ladies and gentlemen, you have now seen it all. This is a stretched lager. You know something interesting? It costs exactly the same to elongate a lager as it does a Cadillac. In fact, you'd have to say this one probably cost even more because it's got three doors on either side, and that's an expensive cut-and-shut job. It seems peculiar, therefore, that they haven't fitted any of the usual accoutrements found in a limousine. There's no video player, there's no drinks cabinet, there's no burr walnut fittings. Not really any fittings at all, actually. For the sound of that workmanship. This will never make the grade as a cherished classic. And nor, I suspect, will this. The cars here, for the most part, are worthless wrecks. Everyone knows it too, which is why everyone here tries to argue that their car was once owned by someone famous. This Aston Martin, apparently, was once the property of Ernest Hemingway. This Jag was Frank Sinatra's. And this Cadillac is one of 36 in Havana alone that belonged to Mrs Batista. If you want to come on holiday to this superheated American car museum where lavatory paper is considered a luxury good and where all the air conditioning units are Russian and therefore sound like Foxback jets, that's fine. But don't, whatever you do, feel tempted to buy one of the exhibits because, according to the teachings of Karl Marx, the customer is always wrong. The owner of this Maserati wants $50,000 for it. Dream on, baby. Dream on. And there's more from Jeremy Clarkson's Motor World next here on Dave as JC meets America's rudest car dealer. What a lovely bloke. Very rude, but lovely.